And now we welcome Dr. Martin Marty. Marty, so good to have you with us today. There are uh, so many titles you've had, you know, the Dean of American Religion, the, the Master of the Main Line, I'm sure there's many more of them. I want to start by asking you, how has Chicago been so lucky to have you here all these years? I, got, I, I just imagine at some point in time there was a call or a number of calls saying there's another opportunity. And just to tie this up, I think of Joe Paterno. I don't know that story where he was supposed to take over the New England Patriots and he woke up one morning and said, no, this is my calling, I'm here. So tell us a little okay. bit about that. Right after I got here, we had just taken in two permanent foster children and by Illinois law, we couldn't keep them if we'd move. So the first few years I did get a couple of those offers mm -hmm. and until they, I couldn't have moved if I wanted to uh, without leaving them. But after that, we just got settled in here and wouldn't have left for anything. We're real lovers of Chicago. Uh, I travel a lot and can't wait to come home. How did Chicago get lucky? I got lucky. Um, it was all very fortuitous kind of thing. The, uh, I was called to a church in River Forest, Illinois, as a curate, a young starter. And the head minister said, this congregation believes in a learned ministry and we expect our assistant pastors to work on a PhD, and you're next. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so wow. that's how I got started. I'd never dreamed of going to graduate work. Did but, you um, did you ever uh, have a tension between wanting to stay in the parish or be an academic? What led you to take the academic route? I could have been just as happy being in a parish. Uh, one side of me never quits. I like to think I'm dealing that way with students, whether they're people of belief or not. Uh, graduate school is a very scary place. And I really like to um, enter their lives, not in a snoopy, close-up way, but just empathy. Uh, and that's very similar to, to it. I've always kept on some range of uh, sick calling and uh, dealing with the mentally ill, things that just come up along the way if you let it happen. Um, but once you get plunged into it, it would be very hard to interrupt. You, you just spend all these years, all those hours in the library, mm -hmm putting it there together, and all of a sudden it starts clicking and you say, oh, this is the story I wanted to tell. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I've been happy in both. So 50 plus books, Marty. Yeah. Publishers for 60 years now almost, right? Mm -hmm. What's been the inspiration for some of these? You mentioned in the, the clip we saw, there was a personal inspiration about the one book you talked about. How do you decide what you want to write about? And your books have been hugely impactful in, in mm -hmm. across the American landscape in terms of religion. Even the book that I did allude to, and uh, I wrote after my late first wife's death, was asked for. Uh, the publisher said, would you? Uh, we used to have a place on Washington Island in Wisconsin, and in summer, different people come by, and sometimes there were publishers. We'd sit around a campfire, and they'd say, you know, uh, this has been bugging me. Why don't you do so-and-so? So, -and -so? so um, I would say I've kind of impoverished imagination. They give me something, I can run with it. But I've never said, I think I should next write so-and-so. So where do you get the inspiration? What tends to happen is you go through several years. For several years, I was very busy with the Park Ridge Center for the Study of Health, Faith, and Ethics. Suddenly, so get, I mean, I, I was told before that I, 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 I had faith, but I didn't have ethics. <laughs> <laughs> and it was medical ethics. I had no medicine. Right. Um, but they plunged you in it, and I really loved it and got involved with it in many ways. And then the American Academy of Arts and Sciences said, we'd like it if you'd make a scholarly study with your associate, uh, Scott Appleby, uh, of comparative fundamentalisms around the world. Well, that took eight years right there. Uh, you do some spin-off books along the way, but that just became the concentration. And I think it's been that way all the way. I found it remarkable to imagine how productive you've been in your writing and then to imagine all those children in the house. <laughs> and you said you wrote in hiccups. I mean, can you paint a picture of how that worked? What was your writing routine like? Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe they were the inspiration. I mean, I really, really love children uh -huh. and I learned from them. Um, my uh, dissertation advisor was Daniel Borston, later Librarian of Congress, and he dedicated one of his books to his three sons, and he said, like, like genius, simple, that's why they're the best teachers. Mm -hmm. wow. And I think that you listen to them and follow it. Um, we camped in all but three states, 13 oh. foreign countries, towing a little trailer behind, <laughs> uh, and you learn so much through their eyes. And I think that was often it. And I'd often ask myself, can this be translated to their world? You can't talk down, they'd catch it right, right away. Right. But I think that's always been 
a big part of it. I love imagination, and they're the ones that have it. I'm fascinated by what you said before, because you have the long view, and you can take the long view. And the publishing world has changed a lot, obviously, in the last 60 years. Was there a time where you were able to hang out or uh, spend time with other writers in Chicago? I'm thinking of somebody like uh, Andrew Greeley, who's been writing for a long time, right? My interesting side Andrew note. Andrew Greeley is very disrespectful of me because I'm three hours older than he is. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> We've always kidded through the years right, about right. that. That uh, I had the, He said, Marty has that sagacity and wisdom of age, and I have the youthful vision. <laughs> But no, we hang out a great deal at the University of Chicago, a great deal. Uh, I love the Chicago writer orbit and the voice. So there was, a, was there a time where you all would, you know, I mean, you were all doing your own thing, but would you get together around coffee? Would you talk about what's going on in the landscape? I mean, did that happen? It happens inevitably, and of course, the, the campus is the first place. Okay. But you have, like, Northwestern up the street, and numbers of the small colleges here have some very good writers, and they... Uh, they welcome a larger company. At the university, you've got Saul Bellow, Richard Stern, you go right down the list of all these famous right. people. But uh, it's more fun to catch them on the way up before right. it's all formed, and we so, hung out. So I want to ask you, as a historian, you take the long view. In all your years as a historian, what's been the change in the world of religion that has most surprised you? I think probably uh, they, well, there are two of them come right away. You can't take anything for granted anymore. Before I said, uh, when I was a minister, it wasn't as, uh, not as hard as, uh, as it is today. Because I think people, if you were Catholic, you're gonna stay Catholic. Mm -hmm. If you're Methodist, you're gonna stay Methodist. You are what your parents were. That ran through World War II and into the 50s. Now, um, pick and choose is, is, is a big mm -hmm. part. And every minister, every priest is very busy. Um, I think there's an authenticity because you have to build loyalty to the gospel and to the cause. But, um, and as that's... we run out of time, what's the second one? <laughs> <laughs> well, we can come back to it. Too. It sounds like you're yeah. talking about loyalty yeah. was different back yeah. in the yeah. day, right? Yes. As it is. Okay. Um, not that people are worse, it's just that the, the lures are so anymore. Sure, sure, sure. The other, I think, is the extremism in religion. Ah. Uh, I grew up in the 50s, which was an era in which I mentioned Daniel Borston, my advisor. Uh, was a group of people called consensus historians. They didn't really believe that America had big extremes except mm -hmm. civil war. And uh, you could really coast in the Eisenhower era on some common assumptions. And now, every time you open your mouth, every minister, you, you're, you've got people out there that didn't join the church because of a particular message of that sort, and, uh, and yet you're supposed to be prophetic and, and judging and preaching gospel. Marty, we asked you before what were the two big surprises you'd seen, and the first was the way in which people can pick and choose their religious faith, and then you said the second was the rise of extremism. Yes, uh, all kinds of extremism. Um, one of the fundamental visions of life I have as a Christian, but also in the life of a republic, is in the words of the Apostle Paul, we are members one of another. We are not super individualists like Ayn Rand thinks we are who teaches you to be anti-altruistic and so on. And you constantly hear this kind of pitch that if you just pull yourself up by your bootstraps mm -hmm. and you do it, then you'll have a great republic. We have a great republic when we took on big problems, building the West. That was tremendous. Uh, it was never easy, it was never smooth or beautiful, but you did. Uh, think of the picking up the pieces after the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln's speeches. And yet somewhere for all the hundreds of thousands of people, you've killed each other, and yet you knew you had to build a nation. And I think that uh, that held through the Cold War. <laughs> Ever since, there always have been extremes in America, mm -hmm. but I'm saying that which tears us apart so you can't even have political debate. I love politics, I love political debate, but now uh, you're, you're cut off instantly mm -hmm. either side. And religion is a big part of it. That's what it does, the heating up. Religious symbols are among the richest we have, and they can be used for reconciliation, uh, peacemaking, or they can be used to justify anything. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I love about you, Marty, is you're a very forward-looking person. You've had a great experience and a great history, but you're always thinking about what's next. And so let me pose this question to you. My dear grandmother, who was my inspiration, uh, passed away at 92, and I used to ask her about her faith journey, and she would say, Dan, I've been a Catholic my whole life. I've looked into other religions, read and studied. She said, if you asked me if I would have seen things that have happened in my lifetime, I, I never could have imagined mm -hmm. it. So the change that has happened has been remarkable to me. Do people think about religion as non-changing, but does it really evolve and change somehow? 
just the other day, my wife and I were visiting. We were Lutheran, and uh, we, we were discussing change, and I said the light bulb story about uh, how many Lutherans it take to change the light bulb. Change? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we all have that in our denomination, or you're not going to budge. Uh, that's, that's a big part. Okay. There's a, uh, in, in the life of the church, there was a banner some years ago, the seven last words of the church, we never did it that way before. So there's a strong impulse if you have something that tends to work. Now, if you're a teenager, you're bored silly by something repeated yeah. twice. But in the course of a long life, you want to be there for the dark times and death times and happy times. And so you naturally uh, have a tendency toward that. The prophets always break in. The biblical prophets, the uh, Martin Luther Kings, they break in mm -hmm. and say you can't have it quite that way. But overall, we like, uh, we like that. And uh, I think what we're doing now is we have every kind of artificial big, well, in, in politics, you have huge campaign expenditures, things are determined by the media and so on, and uh, so people sort of cling to what they think will be most secure for them, and we're moved mainly by fear. Mm. For you, um, the Lutheran Church and its teachings have been such an important part of your life, but I was curious, if you couldn't have been a Lutheran, what would you have been <laughs> if you had another <laughs> life to live? I love that question. Yeah. Well, uh, we used to play that game. Uh -huh. I'd say I'd either be a Roman Catholic or a Mennonite. Uh -huh. And they said, how can you do those two things? Well, I love the liturgy, the theology that goes with Catholicism. I like the simplicity and the ethic that goes, mm -hmm. goes with the, uh, with the Mennonitism. Um, but I've always taken some comfort as I go out into the interfaith world. We had a Lutheran editor some years ago who was, we called him a solid dog, a real journalist. Uh -huh. And um, it was a magazine called Look, and they interviewed Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, to get a divorce mm -hmm. and so on. After they went through all of his, they said, uh, Dr. Ruff, do Lutherans believe theirs is the only true faith? He said, yes, they just don't believe they're the ones that have it, only ones that have it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I think that kind yeah. of gets to it. It doesn't solve everything. Right, right, right. But it does suggest that you can be too sure of yourself and right. seek a monopoly. Yeah. <laughs> So Marty, I'm sure people ask you for advice all the time, and it, that, it may get tiring, but may, maybe it doesn't, but I, I want to take the opportunity for both Lillian and myself. Lillian's a pastor in the UCC church, and I'm a lay, lay Catholic person. Mm -hmm. what, what do we need to be doing? What, you know. Build community, tell stories, get the young involved. I meet extremes among the young that are totally wiped out from anything serious. Mm -hmm. And I meet the most astonishing ones that are all over the world. They, they take a year out of college. They do that kind of thing. Uh, inner city, my wife and I work sometimes with people that come from all over the country, and they'll be in the near west side. Uh, their parents are worried silly because they never knew that world at all. The kids don't think about that at all. I think we counted a few Christmases ago trying to get a quorum of our grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I think there were seven different nations at the time. And uh, I have a grandson who was... Uh, scuba diving in Australia. Well, his research project for doctoral work is saving the uh, coral yeah, reefs. Mm -hmm. And uh, how can you beat it if your hobby happens to match <laughs> that? Right, yeah. right, right, right. So, so I'm very serious about that. So I'm, I'm cheered by that, and I think we have to cultivate that more. And any time we let things get boring, we're in trouble, because that's the word that kills things off. Right. Uh, if you can get them into the story in a special way, get them involved, uh, they do astonishing things. So what has prevented you from ever getting bored with this subject after studying it for all these years? <laughs> it, you couldn't possibly. I, I have a, the Oxford Encyclopedia of Chess, mm -hmm. which says the first move is eight moves and the second is what, 78, and by the third move. And the, it, it goes on, the last line is, in other words, it is believed that there are potentially more games, more moves on a single chessboard than there are believed to be uh, neutrons in our universe. Wow. And at a University of Chicago astronomer, I once said, now with the Hubble, you know, you got all these new, a billion, billion galaxies, billion, billion galaxies. Could that still be true? Let's see, 100 to the 78th power. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you have all those options, how can you get bored? Yes, yeah. yes. Everything is put together. Every child, yes. it's a total surprise what they come up with. Uh, students, good students. I, I always had better students than I deserved mm -hmm. and learned from them just because they put things together that we hadn't seen yet. Mm -hmm. And I've been off the scene now 13 years and I think if I walked in, it'd be like a whole new world. Well, thank you so much for sharing your universe of ideas with all of us.